Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Lo Kia Kenge with Nidhi Shukla. Um, we are talking to Himali today. You might know her from TikTok and Instagram. Her and I started talking a little while ago and got to talking about Desi upbringing. And so many of the things that she said resonated with me. And I really thought it was like just me experiencing them. And it was like a memory unlocked for me when she was bringing them up. We're going to talk a lot about this, the upbringing, generational trauma, uh, feeling loved, wanted, safe within this community, the things that she has encountered in the beauty community within South Asian women um, in terms of colorism and body positivity and whatnot. So I'm going to have her join the call. Okay. Hi. <laughs> hi. So I already um, introduced you a little bit off camera, but now that you're here, can you explain who you are, your pronouns, what you do, where you're from? Okay, so hi guys. I'm Hamali, Hamali Mystery. Um, I am from Toronto. I am a content creator. I use a lot of my platforms to really advocate for um, women's rights and mental health and um, really just kind of help people feel empowered in themselves. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And yeah, is there another question I missed? No, that's it. I just, I love the vibe already. <laughs> Okay, so you and I came across each other on TikTok like everybody else in this thing. Yes. Magical world of TikTok. And we started talking about Desi upbringing. And I feel like that is such a huge topic. Like everything else that we've discussed in other episodes have been like uh, more niched issues, I think. More yeah. niched experiences. But the overall experience of growing up Desi, especially in a Canadian culture, is so different. I feel like when you grow up in like more of a Western culture, so let's say Canada, the States, even the UK, mm -hmm. um, there's such a disconnect between like your home life and your like, I guess, social life, your outside life. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it, I felt really and I think this this goes more so when you grow up in a Desi household that where you have immigrant parents, yeah. Um, because I feel like they kind of get stuck in the mentality of whenever they left their country, like whatever year they left their country, they they're kind of they're stuck. still there. Yeah, they're still there. Yeah. And so you have this home life of okay, I'm Desi, I'm Indian. Um, I gotta follow these Indian rules, but then you go to school or work or whatever and then you have this other side to you that is more westernized and for me personally i felt such a disconnect between who i was i didn't really understand um how i should act who i should be i felt like i wasn't indian enough to be indian and i wasn't canadian enough to be canadian exactly so, yeah i've said that yeah. so many times i feel that so deeply yeah and i and you know i think so many people felt that but never talked about it growing up um because i felt like i was the only one kind of going through that experience exactly and yeah i grew up around a lot of brown people so i would say i had more of um an understanding with my friends and just like the people I was surrounded by but still there was this side of you that you just never talked about this disconnected feeling that you just never talked about and also just the upbringing of the cultures that you kind of grow up grow up in so mm. um any type of this you are or South Asian that you are you you have a similar similar cultural upbringing with your parents and a lot of times it can be very like strict and it can be very um confusing and it can be uh just against your own values and morals and you joke about it with your friends like oh yeah my parents would never let me go out to that party or like i like i have to be home by seven and everyone kind of like mutually understands that like those are the rules you follow mm. like you get it or like oh you can't date or you can't wear certain things um but no one talks about the impact that it has on your mental health. No one talks about like how much it actually kind of screws with you. It's like, oh, ha ha ha, like I'm Indian and like, yeah, that's, that's what, that's what it's like. That's what yeah. life is like. But no one ever sat there and like questioned it, you know, and no one ever really said, hey, this type of upbringing or like these rules that I constantly have to follow and feeling like I'm constantly monitored and um, not having that independence and freedom is really affecting me. It's affecting the way I feel about myself. It's giving me depression. It's giving me anxiety. I feel like I don't know who I am. And 
Um, that leads to that leads to the question of like we don't even talk about a lot of mental health things in brown households so yeah when you do start to realize that it's affecting your mental health you're like okay but now what like I'm even more isolated because I can't talk about it like those words aren't said in brown households you know exactly exactly and I think it's also like you know you're scared because people will just normalize the experience because exactly. every brown person goes through this oh yeah. well like you know my parents didn't let me do this this and this and i'm fine oh my parents beat me growing up and i'm fine and i'm like mm-hmm. no you're not yeah it <laughs> gets treated fine. like the norm and you're like kind of expected to just take it because that that is what brown upbringing is like and you're like okay but when you grow up in a more western culture you have such a guilt surrounding the things you want to explore from your canadian side and like i don't know were you born here yeah i was born, born in canada yeah. yeah so i think like that makes a big difference i think if you live a part of your life in india you're kind of a bit more enmeshed in both like mm-hmm. in this collectivist and individualistic society and like the, the way in which we live but when you're born here you're you're really immersed in the canadian culture so like from yeah. media we consume and like watching our friends grow up and everything and and you know what that what I've noticed okay so like I grew up in Brampton which mm. was which is like a very like brown brown area city. Yeah. yeah like a very brown area and so all of my friends are brown I would say like at least like eighty to eighty five percent of our school was like Desi people Desi yeah. South Asian like brown some all of, of my brown. cousins are from there all of my yeah. cousins are yeah. from I there. feel like everyone anyone that's brown knows yeah they're like oh Brandon, Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you all everyone has family here anyway <laughs> so like it was it was crazy because everyone has this similar experience and so you can relate right but at the same time you see how your um parents mentality trickles down into into the kids and i've always been the type of person that has really questioned like why we do things like why yeah, can't same. i like just be myself why yeah, can't like, i but why but why? yeah exactly yeah. i was like the why kid and yeah. so you know when i was doing things that were out of the norm um i was obviously getting in trouble from my parent like getting judged by my parents and like lectured by them blah blah blah, blah. but i was also feeling that judgment from my group of friends, which is oh, okay. crazy because you would think like, okay, we have the same experience. Mm-hmm. To me, um, it that helped me question a lot of the whys, but for a lot of my friends and the people that I grew up with, they kind of just stayed in their bubble. And so when it came down to things like, you know, why is she wearing that? Like there was like always judgment around it. Growing up brown, it was weird because I felt like people understood what I was going through, but because I also went against the norm, um, they didn't understand like why I wanted to do the things that I did. It wasn't like a full support. Yeah, it wasn't a full support. Like there was definitely judgment um, within that. So it was like good and bad in a way. I think a lot of uh, groups of minorities have this way of like kind of trying to control people who kind of deviate from the norm and I think it's because they think that like culture will get lost in that like if you start doing things that are a little bit out of the norm eventually you're going to associate maybe more with the Canadian culture than Indian culture and I think that's like a deep-rooted fear of a lot of parents who move here being like oh my god they're going to lose side with their Indian side uh lose like touch with their Indian side you know so I think some of it comes from that being like oh she's deviating from the norm and that eventually leads to a disconnect from culture so I completely agree with that. I I can see why that's a fear. But to me, the way I look at it is like, and I don't think a majority of people look at it this way, but to me, I feel like you can never keep culture the same. Culture exactly. is always going to evolve. You can't stop culture from growing and mixing and meshing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it is what it is. Like, my question is, why can't I take the good parts of what Indian culture is like, like the community and helping people, the food and the music and the um, outfits and um, mm. just the the also um, the bonding that you have with the family, like the very family oriented. Yeah. Like, why can't you take all of that and also want to explore like the Western side and take the good things out of that, which is mm-hmm. like, you know, finding yourself and 
um, you know, maybe living on your own, being a little bit more individual. More individual. Yeah. Goals, yeah. Like, why can't you mix the both of them? Like, what's wrong? Like, why do you have to only preserve one and not the other? One of the topics that we said we we're going to discuss was generational trauma. Yes. So I feel like that kind of ties into what we're talking about. Yeah. Were you the one who was kind of aware of generational trauma and the, the effects it can have on you? Was there a sibling that did that before you that kind of introduced these terms? So it was definitely me out of my siblings that I think like started exploring this first um, because I kind of was thrown into it because of my um, condition. I have a condition called PMDD. So I get like really bad. It's like it's like PMS but okay. like on steroids. And so like I get oh, really no. bad mood swings and um, like basically I can get like super angry. I can get super depressed. Like it's just like really crazy mood swings. My emotions are all over the place in and around my period. Okay. And um, when I was really going through the thick of it, I was just like, what is causing these mood swings? And I kept going to doctors and they kept telling me like everything's fine like you're fine blah blah blah. just it is what it is and I was like no there has to be that. yeah like, there's so I much of that too. around periods they're like oh yeah. it's just this is how your period is and I'm like no I'm passing out every period this is not normal. oh god yeah. I went through that for like maybe like two to three years oh my god. and um I I just like I couldn't do it anymore I was I was absolutely losing my mind and I think um after that I one of my friends introduced me to Reiki mm -hmm. and oh my god, um, I want to start Reiki so good I love it I think it's one of those things like you have to be open to it in order yeah. for it to like actually do something. Um, oh my God, I'm but so yeah, in this story. Okay. Yeah. So she introduced <laughs> me to Reiki. And for those of you who don't know what Reiki is, it's basically like energy healing. Basically your body holds like certain energies, good and bad. And it's just supposed to clear your energy so that all your chakras align and that you feel like your best self, like you can be in tune with your best self. Hmm. And so I started doing that. And I think through that is when I started to learn, um, just how much emotions and like negative emotions like guilt and resentment and hate and um, anxiety like that I just like held inside of me I think that was my first eye-opening moment to it because mm -hmm. when I started Reiki a lot of things started to shift in my life like a lot of um, relationships started to fall apart and once they started falling apart and I kind of let it let them go I felt like such a huge relief in my life and mm. I started to really question what what was happening in my life like what was I holding in that I never really talked about before and that was causing me to feel like this deep level of anxiety and depression and um, I think that's where that journey really started it, it got me thinking about okay, there has to be something that I'm holding inside of me that is causing all these problems. And um, that's when I started exploring like generational trauma and like my own tra like childhood trauma and um, my relationship with my parents and how that affected me. And, um, you know, as soon as I started going on that journey, my, my period actually became regular, which is crazy. Wow. And this was the first time in my life where I felt like I actually had figured it out. Like I could figure out why it was irregular. And it's because so much of my body was holding all this trauma, yeah. holding all these like suppressed emotions that I just never let out. And it was subconsciously affecting my body in a way where it was physically manifesting. Once I started like really addressing these problems and like letting go of those emotions and like processing them, I was able to come to a point of feeling healthier and more put together that is so yeah interesting i wish we talked more about that like i wish we were taught more about how the body and the mind are so much more connected than we think so like much now, more connected as an adult i kind of if anything goes wrong like physically i immediately resort to like okay what am i feeling mentally and mm -hmm. i feel like that's kind of where it should start like that's where we should be taught and i'm not taking anything away from like medicine yeah i still believe in that you know but like yes 
but like your mind they need to work together yeah and i think that like truly your mind has so much more power than you think there's this um book that i'm reading right now called your body keeps the score oh my god that's next on my list oh my god so good it really goes into like how um your brain processes trauma and Mm -hmm. how everything is so interconnected and so that's where you start seeing all these other physical health problems because if you do that for so long like obviously it's going to take away from the way your body should should be functioning yeah and I think that's exactly what happened to me, like just living in that house with my parents and also having like not the best group of friends. Um, and then also just all these suppressed emotions that I had, my body was like constantly in survival mode. And mm. once I started really working through all of those problems, I was able to naturally start healing myself without having to use things like birth control or like taking a Tylenol every day or something like that, which was, it was incredible to like witness. It was, it was like, like, it was like hell, but it was insane. Like to see how that progressed um, just by addressing how I was feeling. It's kind of like a little pressure cooker. I find like a lot of these things adding up. As soon as I like moved out of my parents' house and um, as soon as I dropped my old friends and like just making those types of changes to my environment, Hmm. my body was healing so much faster than it ever had before. And like, I love my parents, like, don't get me wrong. I think like a lot of times when I talk about my parents online and stuff like that, um, like people think like I absolutely hate them or that they're like that I'm trying to paint them as bad people. That I don't think that. I don't think my parents ever have hmm. bad intentions or that they're bad people, but I think we do live in two different worlds and that needs to be like addressed, right? Because yep. they have what they want for me and then I have what I want for me. And I think growing up in that Desi household, you you're you have such an immense pressure to listen to your parents all the time. Yeah. Like they think that that's what equals respect and yep. that's what Um, makes you a good person is like listening to your parents and so because I I didn't do that and my me and my parents clashed a lot it caused such tension in our house and Mm -hmm. now that I'm like away from them and I have my own space our relationship has gotten so much better and I physically feel so much better Mm -hmm. because I'm not constantly worried about like oh my gosh like now I need to go home and see my parents and this is like, I don't know. It just like gave me so much anxiety, like to have to be home. And I would always find myself making excuses to get out of the house. So I didn't have to be around them. And now that I have my own space, I like enjoy going back to go see them because I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, now it's not like anxiety induced. I can, I can be relaxed. I can be present and have a conversation with them without, um, first feeling triggered because I've, worked through a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. and second without feeling like I have to act a certain way or be a certain way at all times and also approach that relationship without any resentment Resentment, or hate which which I was before you know Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of situations when we talk about our parents there's such like a Like, I feel like I have to clarify that, like, they are good people. Like, I'm not talking, like, smack about them, you know? Like, that's not the intention at all. I think unless you've lived this experience, it's so hard to describe the feeling or the relationship to your parents. Because it's nothing but love, but it's also so disconnecting from them. Like, it's such a different reality and their views on on respect and a lot of values are very different than ours like at the core we're the same you know like we're Mm -hmm. we're led with love and respect and everything but the ways in which they think we should show love or show respect are really different than ours and I think a lot of kids will find that those rules stomp on their individuality and their their own personal values which is what like a, a lot of the tension is so in all of these episodes, like somebody has brought up parents and they have said the same thing being like, I love them, you know, like, I feel like we have to specify that like, we're not hating on parents here. That was not that's never the intention. Um, But there is such a disconnect. And I've I've heard so many people say that as soon as they moved, they have uh, kind of flourished their relationships with their parents, because it takes you being in different environments and growing your own self to come back and then be like, okay, like, let's have a healthy relationship, you know? I think it's so important as a South Asian 
women, even a man, but mm. more so women, because I feel like we don't get as much independence. Like there is yeah, a double standard, time. regardless of whether you want to believe that or not. There yeah. is there's a double standard <laughs> between how a parent treats a lot of times. I'm not saying all parents, but like a lot of times of how parents or the culture itself treats men versus it treats Absolutely. women. And yeah. so like getting out of the house and, and being independent is so important to your own growth mm. and also important to healing the relationship between your parents. I think South Asian Desi parents, like they, they do truly love their kids. They just do not have the tools and the language and the ability to express it. Feeling loved and wanted and safe is so different in a brown household or sorry they do all these things to like physically take care of us which again we like love and appreciate but then they'll go and basically emotionally abuse us or emotionally <laughs> neglect us right you and, say with a smile <laughs> yeah like i mean a bit it, of emotional abuse it, yeah I, I feel like it it sounds so harsh saying that but it is what it is it, right yeah. if it is like either emotional abuse or emotional neglect and the emotional that emotional side of raising a child is just as important as the physical it can yeah. have emotionally abusing or neglecting your kid can have the same effects if not worse than physical abuse can it's such a weird and difficult emotion to process as a south asian kid or like a desi kid because you're so conflicted in these two worlds of like, okay, yeah, but they are physically taking care of me and they do do like, you know, they have paid for my education and they have put a roof over my head and given mm -hmm. me food. And, um, you know, if I need something, like I know they're, they're gonna pay for it and they, they got my back like that. But then at the same time, you don't feel loved. You feel like, okay, they do this and they're going to use that against mm -hmm. me like as like blackmail so is it really love yeah. is it really like am i is this out of love or because you have to you get that disconnect of like okay well i'm happy they did all this stuff for me i'm very grateful like i know they had it harder than me and i know i have it better than they did but at the same time why don't i feel loved why don't yeah. i feel like i'm wanted mm -hmm. why do i feel like such a burden all the time mm -hmm. and it's because they never teach they never give you that that affection their way of showing their love mm -hmm. ends up becoming blackmail yeah almost right like oh well i did this for you be grateful, yeah. respect me. Exactly. And it's like, okay, well, if you're only doing this because you expect something in return, is it really love at that point? Hmm. You know? That's such but. a good point. I hadn't thought of these things in so long. You're like unlocking memories as you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, you, can you tell I think about it all? <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Um, I do want to segue into beauty because this whole time too, yeah. I'm like trying not to like get too lost in your eye makeup. It is so nice. <laughs> Um, so you're a makeup artist, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I want to talk about beauty within the South Asian community because you said you've worked with uh, South Asian brides, and yes. we talked about colorism briefly, and I guess just bo body positivity and and just in general beauty within the South Asian community. Mm -hmm. And I want to know your opinion as somebody who literally does who does this. You know, I think it's very. Um... I think beauty standards in general, like the more I've grown up, the more I've realized how, excuse my language, but fucked up they are. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're ever changing. Personally, I didn't, um, I didn't face too much colorism. I, especially around my family, I didn't face too much colorism. Like no one ever really said anything about my skin or like, don't go out cause you're going to get dark. But I heard I it heard a lot. I heard that so much. I, I heard it, I didn't hear it like said directly to me, so it was mm -hmm. never anything that really concerned me, but um, I heard it around me. Yeah. And then working on brides and clients, you get people that are like, oh, can you make me look lighter? And you start to realize like how much of a problem it really is. And what really threw me off was like, you know, I grew up around that. I grew up around people feeling like dark was ugly. And then I went away to university and I was surrounded by white people who were like, Hamali, you want to come tanning with us? Yeah, exactly. And I was like, 
what? Excuse me? <laughs> like, why? I was like, so you're paying to look like me, and yet everyone around me, like, at home is, like, avoiding the sun. I didn't, I don't think I grew up in a household that had fair and lovely. I don't think we ever had it, but I no, knew of family members, either. and I'd seen it in other places, and I knew very well what it was, and I, I remember seeing ads of it online, and I think it started so young being like, oh, like this is a major product, Fair and Lovely. Like I'm supposed to be fair. And we didn't talk a lot about nothing. We didn't talk about anything substantial yeah. really in brown households. You know? But you we didn't don't. talk about the effect that had or like this product that was being sold to our community and what that did to little girls or little little kids, you know? You know, you don't even need to directly be told it. No. It's just everywhere. Hmm. It's everywhere. Like, when you watch Bollywood movies, no one's they're dark. They're all a little bit lighter. Yeah, they're all on the fairer side. Yeah, and like, when you, when people just talk, they'll, they'll be like, maybe they'll, they'll just be like, don't go in the sun, you're gonna get dark. And they may not be like, oh, your skin's dark, it's ugly, but like, what? how else would that translate? Exactly. If, you it, know what I mean? Yeah, it, I didn't even notice how much uh, it had changed the way I think, but when my friends and I would hang out and we'd go to like pool parties or whatever, we'd be chilling, I would always stay in the shade. And mm -hmm. not because I wanted to, but because I had been told that like, Nidhi, you'll get darker if you're in the sun and we don't want that. And I don't remember, yeah. like, my parents never said that. I don't know who said that, where that came oh, from. Oh, it's but just, it's, like, it's, it's such like, a it's, part you, of our No culture. one even needs to say it to you at this point. It's, it's just like a everywhere. lingering thought, yeah. Yeah, it's, like, and, everyone just kind of knows it, you know? I felt so, like, if I look back, I feel so bad for, like, high school or, like, young me being, like, no, I have to stay in the shade, actually. And I, yeah. I would just watch my friends play in the sun. And I'd be, like, yeah. I'm going to stay here. And, like... I don't know. It's just so upsetting, you know? Beauty standards are so bullshit because it just depends yeah. on the way you look at beauty at like that the grass point, is greener right? on the other side for people, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, you might as well just do whatever the fuck you want because you're never going to be enough yeah. at that point. <laughs> like, just who cares, well, life's motto, right? Life motto there. Do you have anything else that you want to discuss? No, honestly. Anything that we such forgot? A great... I, I don't think so. I feel like we covered a lot. I think like we covered, covered just more than the list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but it was so... Um, therapeutic I find oh. to be like oh like you had this experience yeah. too you know yeah no it's true it's it's something nice to be able to not nice but like it's it's nice yeah. to be able to connect with it's people trauma and be bonding, like, you know? <laughs> yeah trauma bonding just being like okay I'm not crazy yeah like I think and that's I think all I felt growing up you that's know that's what a lot I'm of your crazy. videos a lot of your videos make me feel like that that I like oh. make me feel less alone and make me feel seen that so if you guys happy. haven't checked out uh your page where can they find you online um, so I have two pages. I have my Hamali mystery page, which is at Hamali, H-E-M-A-L-I dot mystery, M-I-S-T-R-Y. That is my main page. And then I have another page that's like solely dedicated to really talking about like stigmatized taboo topics, like my upbringing, generational trauma, things like that. And that page is called um, Up to No Good. Um, that's both on Instagram and on TikTok. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was such a lovely conversation. Yeah. It was very therapeutic for me as well. So <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy you said that. All right, everybody. That is it for this episode of Lokia Kenke. I absolutely loved that conversation. I feel like Himali had a lot of similar vibes to Rahat. Um, they are friends and I actually know Himali through Rahat. So maybe that's why. But overall, I loved this conversation. I feel like I was reliving my childhood and just felt overall, just felt really validated in my experience. I hope that you did too. I hope that this unlocks some memories for you where you feel like you're not alone. That being said, thank you so very much for watching this episode. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that uh, it resonated with you. Please leave some comments if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, I would love to hear from you. As always, you guys can find me on uh, Instagram and TikTok at Nidstrukla, N-I-D-S-S-H-U-K-L-A. And thank you for watching this episode of Lokia Kenke with Nidhi Shukla.